Hear now, for this is the word of Guleman, blessed scion of ruin, avatar of the true gods and dark master of chaos. Let only his truest servants hear these truths, that they may prepare for his return. This is his word, this is his will. When the age of ending come, when the false light fades, when the storm screams, when new gods rise, war shall come to the heart of his son's dominion. A host of traitors in cast-off shall rise, gathered by the hand of the unfaithful one. They will pass under the gods' gaze and shatter the chains of his treacherous sons. Then shall fire and blood come upon Macrog once more. The ruined prize shall reveal himself, cloaked in the tattered remains of his former glory, and by his command shall the walls of the tomb keep be brought low. The witness shall perish before his warning can be heard, for none may oppose what has been ordained by his will. To the great beasts who sleep beneath the white shall be awoken by the one who hears their call during his every waking moment. Turn from the fiercest enemy of the primordial truth into pawns of its one true champion. Amidst the ghosts of, pa the ghosts of past shames and failures, the half-breed shall claim honor at last. His life given to serve him as the mingled souls of foes and sons are offered up to be the first part of the gods. At his command from death itself, itself shall be loyal sons return. To oppose the rates of traitors past and bring them up to judgment. The first of the reborn shall heed the command of their one true lord. Their claw and fang shall spill the blood of the unworthy onto hallowed grounds. And as the dark master rises, those who, so yeah, those who foolishly sought to defy him, his, wi his will shall see the truth and be brought to heal to the one they have always served, even in childish rebellion. A great cry of joy and sorrow shall echo to be heard across all stars and the galaxy shall tremble once more before the power of the right, rightful master of mankind. From the Lost Epithets of the Codex Chaotica The Battle of Macrog Part 2 Lords of the Hosts After successfully crossing the path of glory, the forces of Marius Gage launched their assault on Macrog. For the first time since the horde of the Great Devourer had first entered the galaxy, war descended upon the homeworld of the Ultramarines. Ruinous priests called out to their flock to prepare for battle against the invaders, while in the fortresses of Hera, or the fortress of Hera, Mar Marnius Kalgar marshaled the forces under his command. Ancient powers stalked the surface of this trice-accursed world, emerging from their hiding as, they, as their schemes approached fruition. Plans set in motion in previous ages were about to culminate, either in terrifying success or abject failure. The long-awaited revenge of the sacrificed son was but one of these dark agendas, and the dark gods watched eagerly, waiting to see which of their champions would triumph and prove worthy of their favor in the coming age. For all who knew of the Black Crusade knew that however the Battle of Macrog ended, its result, its result, I guess, would shape the course of history for centuries to come. The Black Crusade's forces rained down upon Macrog from skies burning with the fire of the orbital battle. In thousands of infernal temples, archpriests of chaos declared that this time of judgment had come, that the time of judgment, and that the gods faithful now had one last chance to prove their worth by fighting against the invaders and displaying their might and devotion to the ruinous powers. The streets of the streets of the intricate network of districts and temples covering most of Macrog's main landmass ran red with blood as billions of cultists were roused to fight and die for the Legion's masters. 
bloody sacrifices, the dark gods took place in the temples as magi summoned demons, binding them to the bodies of their congregation's most exalted members in the hope of creating enough demon hosts to stand a chance against the legion's forces descending upon Macrog. In many cases, these attempts resulted in a disaster as the priests lost control of the Neverborn, which rampaged freely, devouring the souls of their would-be masters, before emerging from the temples in search of more prey. Uncaring of what the battle raging on the rest of uncaring about the battle raging about on the rest of the planet. Anti-aircraft artillery installed to defend against another Tyranid assault. <laughs> opened fire on the waves of troops car troop carriers, sending many plummeting to the ground in flame. But orbital bombardment took out all such emplacements as soon as they revealed themselves, a tactic not available to the creatures of the Great Devourer, while also clearing out a vast section of land where the Black Crusade troops could land relatively safely. Once that breach was established, Gage stopped sending sacrificial troops, Thousands of evocati, bred in Gage's gene laboratories on cult, were unleashed upon Macrog, their minds consumed by implanted directives and infused with the hatred of the sacrificed son to drive them onwards. Behind them came Gage's true allies, Astartes from all legions, united only in their hatred of Gulliman's legacy and desire to see Macrog burn. As their boots hit the ground, warbands that had been on the verge of turning on one another as the Black Crusade made its way to Macrog fought side by side like sworn brothers, their feuds forgotten as they exulted in the destruction they wrought. Gage fought at the head of his troops, leading from the front as a true lord of chaos, and all who faced him fell. His claws cleaved ultramarines in two, while his gaze caused them to ignite with indistinguishable flames. Many came at him, seeking the glory that killing the sacrificed son would bring them, but none could come as so far as to scratch his armor. He dodged all attacks, moving with a swiftness that bellied his bulk. As if he were showing off, he avoided even blows that would have had no hope to penetrate his armor and infernal aura. Those who stood at his side knew that this was because he was wary of the possibility of assassins hiding among his enemies and wielding disguised weapons capable of slaying him. Paranoia, always a prudent way of life among the servants of chaos, was something Cage had made into an art form over the millennia. The fact that the Ultramarines war bands, traitor legions, agents and imperial assassins had been trying to kill him for thousands of years in increasingly inventive ways, only added justification to his caution. The sacrificed son fought surrounded by the low, by the loaded ones, the wraiths drawn to their former lord, had they not been on a crog and facing the enemies responsible for their entombment, there was little doubt that they would have turned against Gage, who had abandoned them and left them to rot for thousands of years. But their hatred for Gulliman's slaves was stronger, and they ravaged the forces ar arrayed against them with all the terrible powers at their disposal. Psychers in a kilometer wide radius around Gage fell to their knees, wailing in terrible pain as the loaded one's malicious aura stabbed right into, the, into their dark souls. Marius's landing point was several hundred kilometers south of the fortress of Hera for the stronghold was too well protected for a direct assault from orbit. The first planetary target of the Black Crusade was one of the world's hundreds of temples, one that had only been built a couple of centuries ago, but which already held sway over several million souls. The temple had been built around the body of a chaos preacher, whose fiery charisma and inspired rhetoric had caused a, dozens of a dozen of imperial worlds to rebel against the false emperor. So powerful had been his hold on his followers that when he had been slain by a world eater champion, they had recovered his body and brought it all the way to Macrog, where it had become the focus point of a new cult of chaos undivided. But for all the strength of the cult holding the temple, it was swept aside with contemptuous ease by Cage's forces, his priests' pleas for help from their dead saint going unanswered. 
Once the purging was done, Gage himself strolled into the temple, ready to unlock the next step of his plan. The temple was a place dedicated to darkness and debasement, where ruin ruled supreme. Icons of the Eightfold Star were emblazoned on the walls, anointed in the blood of human sacrifices. Brazers burned with eldritch flames, casting shadows that moved whenever they were directly looked at and seemed to stare back when they were. The Chaos Lord walked through the blood-soaked remains of the battle, where cultists had fought among the relics of their fate. Marius' infernal countenance was right at home in this decor, as was that of Castus, who walked at his side. The ground cracked under the feet of the massive plague lord, with the corpses rotting and every stone moaning in protest at the kiss of his entropic aura. They passed devotional scriptures and tapestries of the preacher, who remains, whose remains were buried at the center of the temple, not sparing them a single glance. They were alone, at Marius' command, his forces had departed the temple once he had been cleansed of life. At the heart of the temple was the sarcophagus of Maheros, the eight-eyed prophet of chaos undivided. Eight-eyed, well. It was fashioned of obsidian, sculpted in the image of the holy man. So precise was the artistry that had gone into the sculpture that it looked like the stone prophet was merely sleeping on an ornate beer. The dark blessing that had blessing, yes, that had given the prophet his title had also ren been rendered. In addition to the two pairs of eyes on his face, the statue sponsored another, another eye on the back of each of his hands, which were clasped on its chest in prayer, and another pair of eyes was visible on its exposed chest. All eight eyes, which had been, which had seen so much of lo in life, were now closed. Castus commanded the sacrificed son, and the plague lord walked forward, rising his mace above his head with both hands, focusing all his strength before striking the sarcophagus. The energies of the weapon clashed with the protective spells woven in the stone, and after a deafening boom, there was only the smallest crack running down the petrified Maheros' face. But that was enough. The ward had been breached. Get back, called Marius, now! Castus stepped away as a thick black as a thick black smoke began to rise from the cracks in the sarcophagus. He had only taken a couple of steps before the coffin exploded, sending a hail of obsidian shards that shattered against Gages and Castus's armor. More black smoke rose from the debris, and within it a figure collapsed into existence, tall and terrible, only only impressions of its form could be glimpsed by, Cactus, by Castus, for it was not a thing meant for mortal eyes and thoughts. What Marius saw in the smoke, the plague lord could only guess. But Castus saw skeletal hands and a great horned skull. He saw blood dripping fangs and reptilian scales, lettered wings that turned into bat like appendages and black, ruin covered antique armor that dissolved into an assemblance of crystalline interwoven plates. There was a sense of immense power in the figure, but also one of inc incompleteness, as if something had been ripped out of its very core. But in spite of, of this gaping void, there was still power in the entity that rose from the tomb of Maheros, and Castus stepped back until he, had st he was standing several meters behind Marius, watching what he had unleashed with the slightest terror of unease in his rotting guts. Even Paramedes was silent before this ancient nightmare. Marius, spoke the creature, glaring at the sacrificed sun with, with eyes that had, been, that had seen the rise and fall of entire species. The time has come for our bargain to be fulfilled. I, Belacor, replied Gage, standing before the firstborn demon prince without any sign of fear. It has indeed. My armies march onto the surface of Macrog once more. Can you prove what you promised me? That we might as we might at long last take our revenge upon Gulliman. Belacor laughed and expanded his, his wings behind him, tearing great rents into the temple's walls. Oh yes, son of the gods. 
Long have I dreamt of this moment, as I waited in this prison of stone and sorcery, weaving my power into the minds and souls of these world's fools. Behold! Centuries before the sacrificed son had issued the call for the Black Crusade against Macrog, Marius had forged a pact with the demon prince Belacor, master of shadows, firstborn of the gods, and once the dark master of chaos. A mantle that had been taken from him by Gulman at the dawn of his rebellion against the Emperor. Belacor had plenty of reasons to hate Marius, who had fought at Gulman's side in the Eye of Terror, in the very big campaign that had led the Demon Prince into being stripped of most of his power, and left a ruined reflection of his former glory. But Cage's proposition managed to catch the ancient fiend's interest. Taking a human host, Belacor had unleashed his evil upon the galaxy in an open manner, ruining no more lives than he would have otherwise, but earning fame in his new disguise. He had manipulated his followers to ensure that upon the apparent death of his host, a nameless wretch whose soul, the Master of Shadows, had only deigned, de had only deigned devour to hide his tracks, the body was taken to Macrog. Released from his tomb and the seals that had hidden his presence on the world, the Master of Shadows could finally wield the full measure of his power once more. He reached out across Macrock, though his psychic connections, yeah, through his psychic connections, he had subtly cultivated for centuries and exerted his will. Old grudges flared in the black souls of ruinous priests, and they commanded their flocks to attack the followers of their old enemies instead of marching to the front line to fight the invaders. Seconds in command stabbed superiors they had faithfully obeyed for centuries in the back. Their ambitions strove to unprecedented heights. Keepers of unholy relics whose strength of will had held the whispers of their, of their charges at bay succumbed to temptation, breaking the casings and picking up tools of damnation that gave them a brief taste of power before swallowing their souls and puppeteering their bodies to wreak havoc. Three of Macrog's cults were even completely swayed to the cause of Belacor, their members having been slowly brainwashed by their priest's sermons until little enough of their free will remained that the Master of Shadows could simply break it. Not all who had knelt and prayed in Belacor's temple fell under the demon's sway. Some of his targets resisted his influence. Where they sensed the intrusion in their thoughts or not, others failed to perform their task and were promptly slain by their own comrades or in the case of one priest torn to bloody pieces by his own congregation for trying to lead them astray. But the firstborn had ha, had had centuries to weave his influence across Macrog, and enough succumbed to throw the entire front into chaos. Accusations of treachery and heresy flew, and soon the billion strong host Cultus rose to stop the Black Crusade, was tearing itself apart while monsters stalked the streets, feeding their ancient hungers upon those who had kept them sealed for so long. For these never bore no worship, no matter how fanatical could match the sweetness of blood spilled in slaughter. Blackguard laughed at the madness his scheme caused. A dark and terrible sound that drove those closest to him and are strong enough to insanity. Next to the demon prince, the sacrificed son nodded approvingly. And for the north, far to the north, excuse me, and far to the north, a sorcerer in blue and black armor suddenly went very still before dropping his quill, turning from his open grimoire and stepping out of his chamber driven to go where only a very hand few souls were allowed to venture. The mind of that ultramarine had all but collapsed as the hidden instructions took over his body, but such was the size of the structure he was in that it would take him hours to reach his destination, and while he walked, a crock burned. With Belacor unleashed, Cage's army began their advance towards the fortress of Hera, not all followed the sacrificed son's lead. Entire warbands broke off from the main force, seeking their own glory and plunder, both of which could be found in abundance within Macrog's countless temples. 
Gage let them go. He had always known they would act this way, and their actions still served his designs, increasing the mayhem and keeping the Colts from regrouping. The bulk of his army, a host of nigh 20,000 Astartes, all told, and millions of mortals, was still under his control, and they tore a bloody path through the megalopolis, toppling dark cathedrals and slaughtering millions of cultists. The air was filled with a stench of blood and burned flesh as fires spread unchecked across entire districts. No natural flames were these, but the result of sacrificial pyres that had not gone out in thousands of years, only to be spilled as their temples were ransacked. For all the might of Cage's army, however, the cults of Macrog were experts at urban warfare, and even disunited by Belacor's tricks, there were still many who fought tooth and nail against the invaders. They had spent a hundred generations sharpening their skills by fighting one another over doctrine differences, and to capture sacrifices to offer to Gulliman on their blood-stained altars. And these skills were turned upon Gage's soldiers. Ambushes and countercharges were sprung every kilometer, cultists rushing the army with hooked daggers, demon-mounted pistols, and other more improvised tools of war. While these weapons were little threat to the Astartes and Gage's army, except for a few of the sacrificial knives, which had been imbued with genuine power by thousands of deaths, they still exacted a toll upon his mortal element, and slowed the Black Crusade's progress. The carnage drew more and more neverborn, like carrion eaters, and they fashioned bodies for themselves from the corpses of the dead, adding more mayhem and confusion. At the side of Marius' cage, Carlos Icarius watched as warbands gathered under the Crusade's banner rampaged through the streets of Macrog Civitas. Many of the temples the warrior king had known during his time on the planet were gone, replaced by another congregation as their fortune fell. Not that it mattered, they were chaff, slaves only fit to serve their betters, and on this day, die at the blades and bolters of the greatest host come to end their world. There was displayed the grotesque unity of chaos, as warriors sworn to rival powers fought side by side, revealing in the slaughter of weaker prey. The heavens rumbled with the dark gods' booming laughter as their servants butchered each other, driven by a hatred ten thousand years old. The hate of Robut Guleman, who had led them to break their oaths to the Emperor and fail to deliver the glorious victory he had promised. The victory for which they had bled. Sicarius didn't share the hatred himself. His reasons for joining Gage's, for joining Gage were more por- personal, but he could still appreciate the spectacle, the strength of emotion. With the power of Amniac pulsing through his soul, he could actually see the spiritual connection between the warriors. Blood angels and imperial fists fought back to back against the tides of cultists, laughing together as they battled, as they bathed themselves in mortal blood. Salamanders called out their distant Primarch as they burned temples to ash with powerful warp flamers, dedicating the souls caught in the Inferno to the Black Dragon. White Scar Raiders and Space Wolves Wolfen hunted ahead of the main force, spreading chaos within the enemy ranks and claiming the choices, the choices prize in return for this most risked assignment. Vadborn Evocati fought the one battle they had been bred and trained for, led by renegade ultramarines whose spite was perhaps the strongest of all. And there, emerging from the broken gates of a dark cathedral, whose bells had rung without pause for Eon and they had finally been silenced, was a group of one raven guard pure blood and a pack of spawn marines, surrounded by dozens of men and women wearing the finest finery of imperial nobility, slaughtering the cultists with their bare hands, their strength as inhuman as the expression on their faces. The son of Korax and his minions had come to call just before the Black Crusade's departure, and Gage had not dared deny them a place in his armada, even though he was certain he had not called for them. Even the throes of Battleas, the other warriors of the host, 
stayed well away from the, from the strange and disturbing presence of the Raven Guard legionaries. Even as they started to walk against the tide, their purpose on Makrog apparently fulfilled by the destruction of that particular temple. The other forces parted to make way for them. The champion of Slanesh caught a glimpse of something being cradled in the arms of the pure blood leader. A container of some kind, blocky and black as the void. He did not know what it was and he did not care. All the sons of Korax have their trinkets. He sought a far greater prize. Cage had called the Dark Angels and the Iron Hands, sending emissaries to the Eye of Terror to petition the Lords of the First and Tenth Legion, offering great treasure and the chance to claim vengeance upon the one who had led them to ignoble failure. But the Sons of the Lion had their own wars to wage, and he had received no reply from the Tenth Legion, nor had any of his messengers returned. Kato had expected as much. From what he had read in the Legion's archives, the bonds between Gulliman and Ferus Manus had been strong, and during the heresy, the Gorgon had been the arch traitor's most loyal general. But he would have thought millennia of exile would have soured the bond. No matter. They had plenty enough warriors, enough to kill every soul on Macrog, if that's what it took to reach the fortress of Hera and the prize within. Caro's mouth grill watered at the thought of the feast that awaited him, and he plunged right back into the melee, shouting dark oaths to his divine patron. As the forces of Cage fragmented and the war spread across Macrog, more of the planet's secrets were revealed. Powerful demons were roused from their temples by the bloodshed, or freed from imprisonment as their prisons were destroyed in the confusion. Ancient mutated creatures, devolved far from the human form after thousands of years, exposed to the warp's baleful energies, burst from the ground. Chaos Magi had, sent, had spent centuries obsessively developing their knowledge of the dark arts, were forced out of their lairs by battle, unleashing devastating sorcery against their attackers. One such warlock was a legionnaire who emerged from the rubble of a destroyed temple, clad in a power armor of ancient design that was covered in ash and gore that it was impossible to make out any legion markings. The Psyker slew hundreds of evocati from both sides of the conflict, displaying, displaying incredible power, before vanishing in a flash of warp energy when he was attacked by several loaded ones. The raids vanished along with him, and none could tell who the mysterious warrior had been, or even whether he had been the master of the temple or its prisoner. Only that his mastery of the warp was great. Marneus Kalgar watched the devastation unfold from the fortress of Hera, and knew that the battle would reach its walls. He had always suspected that would be the case, but Belakor's strategy meant that the Ultramarines would face the traitors without the latter having been bled by the cultists as much as they could have been. He had thought Gage could, couldn't sink any lower when he had seen the renegade legionnaires in his host, but then the sacrificed son had revealed his alliance with the Master of Shadows, Gulliman's own nemesis from ancient times. The Lord of Macrock seated at, this, at the revelation that the spiritual legion's most hatred foe had been here, on the world he was sworn to defend for hundreds of years without his knowledge. His followers sensed his rage and, unwilling to risk it, worked even harder to prepare the fortress for the coming battle. The man hiding on the low, lower decks of the 13 Legion frigate Pyre had forgotten his name many years ago, when the apothecaries had torn him from his people and made him into what he was. But he had chosen a new name for himself after his doom had manifested itself, one charged with hidden truths and bitter irony. He called himself Testament, for he was quite possibly the only living soul in all galaxy who knew the truth of the Ultramarines. Even now, after so many years, Testament didn't know for certain why he knew what he knew. He had been too busy surviving the consequences of that knowledge to investigate its origins. He had theories an aberration of the gene seed, latent psychic powers, or just what passed for the dark god's sense of humor at work. But regardless of the cause, he had seen the bonds, both genetic and sorcerous, that chained the entire 13 legion together. And worse than that, he had seen the hand that held them. 
He knew Guleman wasn't dead, and that the spiritual liege felt nothing but cold contempt for his legion, manipulating them from within his stasis tomb to some unknowable end. An end that Testament had glimpsed in those final moments before the madness had given him the strength to break free of his pod and kill his way out of the laboratory. After years of fleeing through the ruin storm, evading hunters both mortal and immortal, Testament had finally arrived to cult, thinking to find safety in the sacrificed sun's shadow, and for a time it had worked, but then Gage had sent out the call for his crusade. Testament knew full well the terrible might Cage had pitted himself against, but in, the fun, but in the font of the Dark Lord that bubbled within the most chaotic parts of his mind, he thought he had, uh, he had seen a way to end the hunt for his life, a way for Marius to succeed and free the Ultramarines from the shackles of their undying lord. For so long he had not even dared dream that such a thing was possible, but his visions hadn't lied. And so he had hidden aboard the pyre, hiding his presence with wards he had learned from witches and demons, both asking dark boons in return. For months he had remained in the circles, in the circle as the ship crossed the ruin storm with the Black Crusade's armada. His thoughts utterly still, lest they betray his presence to his hunters. But now was the time to come out, to get to the flight decks and find a way down to the planet below. The pyre was shaking from the battle against the defense fleet, and it wouldn't do for Testament's journey to be ended by a stray shell piercing the frigate's hull and detonating its warp core. He didn't have a plan beyond get to Gage and help him win, but he had learned long ago that making detailed plans only backfired, since his enemy was one that was very much still present in his own head. He checked his equipment, stepped out of the circle, and was immediately met by a towering figure blocking the corridor, some 30 meters ahead. Testament froze in his tracks as he recognized the figure, which hadn't been there a heartbeat before. He had seen its like, four like, four like it, mighty and terrible, silent avatars of the will of, a dark, of the dark master of chaos. It was humanoid and bore some outward semblance to a space marine, but no one could ever mistake that being for a mere legionary. It was a thing from the infernal pits clinging to the image of what it had once been in order to be able to walk in the realms where, guards, where gods and mortals met, and it radiated power. How it had come aboard the pyre without every psyker aboard the Black Crusade sensing it was beyond testament, but what it was, wasn't. Tetrak. More than anything, Testament wanted to run. There were other paths out of his lair, and he had been able to outrun every hunter he hadn't been able to outright fight. But he knew that this wouldn't work on the Tetrak. All of his life, the four demon princes had haunted Testament's nightmares, impossibly large silhouettes that drew ever closer to him, never pausing in their hunt. Astartes knew no fear, but Testament was no Astartes. He was Evocati with only a fragment of Guleman's gene seed flowing through his blood, and he knew fear all too well. The sight of the fiend blocking the corridor filled him with primordial, atavastic terror. But perhaps it was because he knew fear, and therefore courage. Perhaps it was because he knew that... Perhaps, yeah. Why was this one so hard? Perhaps it was because he knew what was to come, and had no desire to live to see it. Or perhaps it was simply because he had tried he was tired of running from the monsters who had hunted him all his life. Regardless, Testament didn't run. The Evocati stood his ground before the Tetrak, a young offshoot of the Avenging Sun's line, facing off against one of the Legion's greatest lords. He used every trick he had accumulated during his long run, and he occupied plenty. He accumulated plenty. He drew explosive devices that detonated with the shriek sound of caged demons being released. He spoke words of power that caused the metal walls to bend and crack. He fired wildly with a gun that had been crafted to kill a world's god king. But the Tetrax simply kept walking, never slowing, never accelerating, and any damage inflicted upon him seemed to vanish as soon as the Avocati took his eyes off it. When the last testament when the last of Testament's tools failed, he drew his blade, his oldest weapon, 
taken from the corpse of the legionnaire who had tried to stop him from escaping the gene laboratories, and charged, screaming in fury, terror, and hate. The tetrach barted, baited the sword, wait, batted the sword aside with casual ease, shattering it without even trying. The strength of the blow threw Testament backwards, and he fell to the ground. He turned up, determined to see to at least see his death, and saw the armored hand of the monster approach his head. The hand was the last thing Testament saw before darkness closed in. In orbit, the battle continued, and despite the casualties they had suffered, Calgar's ships were still able to deny complete orbital supremacy to their foe, preventing the Black Crusade Armada from simply bombarding Macrog into oblivion. But the ships loyal to Gulliman's legacy could not cover the entire planet, and one ship bearing the clear marks of Xinchin influence, detached from the from the main Black yeah, from the main Black Crusade fleet, sailing towards the planet's northern pole, above the frozen wasteland that covered this region of Macrog. The ship called the Beckoning Whisper disgorged several aircrafts that descended slowly and purposefully towards the undefeated icy plains. From these transports emerged the one called Oberdeli, the Oracle of Pharos, and his warband of Zichin cultists and Neverborn. The Oracle led his forces further north, braving hollow winds born of souls of unfit sacrifices to the Dark Gods. He had come to Macrog for one purpose and one purpose only, and nothing would stay him from his course. The call burned inside his head. He had heard it constantly, ever since he had been dragged into the furrows and made to listen to its chatter. It echoed inside his skull, on and on, never fading for a single moment. It was the psychic call, the beacon that had drawn the great devourer's horde from the unimaginable darkness beyond the light of the furthest stars. It was the signal that heralded the end of all life in the galaxy, and it was loud enough to silence even the voice of Zich at times. In his rare moments of lucidity, Oberdi knew that he was mad. <laughs> he knew that his enemies struggled to find the pattern in his actions, and knew too that they would find none, for there simply wasn't one. His mind jumped from one goal to the next, simply to occupy itself to try to drown out the noise of the call within his own thoughts. And, at other times, he was pulled into one direction or another, not knowing what he was supposed to do until he reached his destination. His followers thought he was being mysterious and secretive to prevent betrayal, but in truth he genuinely didn't know what he was doing most of the time. It was only afterwards that he understood the purpose behind his actions, though whether that was the actual reason or something constructed by his mind to justify his own madness, not even he knew. But this time things were different. He knew why he had come to Macrog, why he had come to Gage's gathering, even though he hadn't been invited. The sacrificed son had accepted his presence wearily, and Oberdi knew that he had been watched, just in case. That was fine. His presence on Macrog truly would help Gage's cause, though not in any way the warlord could anticipate. All around Oberdi, Oberdi and his warband, the frozen desolation of Macrog's northern pole spread from horizon to horizon. Things very much like boreal auras dance in, this heavens, in the heavens, and terrible shapes could be glimpsed in the luminous display when the snow clouds parted for long enough. Horrors of Zeech and Oberdi's retinue chattered among themselves, speaking of the gods looking down upon them in approval, or hatred, or both. Mortal cultists trembled in the punishing cold. More than half of them had already perished, their frozen bodies left behind on the ice. Only the Chaos Marines remained silent, their bolters held at the ready, knowing better than to assume they were safe just because they couldn't see any obvious peril in their surroundings. Without a warning, Oberdi stopped. There was nothing special about the spot where he stood, but his forces didn't question him. And, at a gesture from him, they withdrew, forming a defensive position some distance behind him. With the white mist blocking his vision, his, his visibility, excuse me, Oberdi felt as if he were truly alone with the noise in his head. 
The oracle knelt and passed, passed his hand on the surface of the ice, pushing aside the accumulated snow to reveal the crystal clear frozen liquid underneath. For a few seconds he peered into the lightless depths between his feet before rising once more and brandishing his staff over his head, holding it in both hands. The sound of call grew the sound of call grew louder and louder until Oberdi's arms were trembling with its beat and his eyeballs shook in the rhythm with it. With a great cry he rammed the staff into the ice channeling the power of the call downwards, along with all the psychic energies he could muster. Lightning descended from the heavens and struck the, stra the staff, traveling down its length and into the ice, using Orbedi's very soul as a vessel to express itself. Entire blocks of ice vaporized and the surface cracked as steam burst out, sending shards of frozen liquid in all directions. And from the depths they rose, Climbing over shattered ice. Centuries ago, when the High Fleet Behemoth had entered the Ruin Storm and attacked Macrog, millions of Tyranid life forms had rained down upon the Demon World. Among these, the tens of thousands had landed on the Northern Pole, for the Xenos Hive Mind had been driven mad by the Ruin Storm and did not act with the vicious cunning it would later display across the rest of the galaxy. These Tyranids had been caught in the cruel climate, made even worse by the ritual of chaos sorcerers, and had been trapped beneath the ice. All Ultramarines had assumed they were dead, but the spawns of the Great Devourer were, were resilient. Most of the smaller creatures had indeed perished, but the rest had survived, entering hibernation preserved by the unnatural cold. And now they rose to the surface, heeding the call booming out or very psychic. There were hundreds, thousands of them, and among them there was one taller than any other, a huge carnifex who had only one eye left. Nice. This was the creature known to the Ultramarines as Old One Eye, a beast who had fought the Lords of Lapis and slain six of them before leaving the Demon World as the High Fleet moved on to Macrog. Its carapace was covered in the scars left by countless attempts to slay it including several wounds that still glowed with eldritch fire where it had been struck by infernal warp-imbued weapons. Old One-Eye screamed as it rose, and the eyes shook and fell apart, revealing yet more tyranids, heeding the call of, his, of this biological war machine. For a moment, the Oracle waited for the claws and fangs that would end his life, convinced that this was the moment of his death. But the Xenos passed right by him, seemingly not seeing him, or at least not registering him as an enemy. Orberti laughed at, at disbelieving mad laughter, even as his escorts were torn to shreds by the Tyranids. He cared nothing for their deaths, even as they called him for help in, this, in their panicked, shocked last moments. He didn't care because, for the first time in millennia, the noise in his head was silent. Alone on the ice, the Oracle of Pharos laughed as the monsters he had released from their centuries-long slumber continued their advance southwards, drawn towards the sprawling cities of Macrog by the heat and promise of prey. Silence, at last. The Tyranids of the North Pole lacked true leadership, but there were plenty of warriors in their ranks, though the Synapse network was still perturbed by the Ruin Storm's baleful emanations. It was enough to prevent the lower beasts from turning against each other, and the Tyranids' hosts went south, driven to destroy everything in their path, obeying some ingrained instinct that not even the madness of Macrog had twisted. Scholars and heretics had spent many years trying to understand why the Tyranids had entered the Ruin Storm in the first place, and came to Macrog in particular, yet they had failed to come up with any explanation more satisfying than the displeasure of the Dark Gods. That theory was left unspoken on Macrog, least to draw the ire of the Ultramarines. Yet it was still spread among the cultists, pushing them to ever greater depravities to reclaim the favor of the, pan of the Pantheon. And as word arrived that the Great Devourer had returned in Macrog's darkest hour, panic began to spread and armies were sent north to face the new threat. But before the Xenos could reach the sprawling megacity, they would first need to cross what had become of the region known as Illyrium, now called the Fractured Land. Illyrium. 
the fractured land. 10,000 years ago, before the young boy who would become Robut Guleman arrived on Makrog, Illyrium was known as the bandit country of the planet, a savage land where barbarian tribes fought one another for glory and occasionally went south to raid their more civilized neighbors. Then Guleman came and brought the tribes to heal, only to abandon their campaign and rush back home when the conspiracy inspired by Belakor unfolded killing his adoptive family and setting Makrox Vitas ablaze. In the years that followed, Guleman never returned to Illyrium, though he sent armies and diplomats to finish what he had started and bring Illyrium into the fold of his new kingdom. But the whispers of descent were quite, weren't quite completely silenced when Marius Gage sacrificed himself at Kalt and unleashed the Ruin Storm. When the warp claimed Makrox, Illyrium was hit the worst by its power, Whatever power preserved the rest of the planet from disillusion to chaos wasn't in effect there. The very land broke apart, divided, divided as its people had been divided for so long. Great land masses rose into the air, flying slowly with erratic patterns. As for the people of Illyrium, they were transformed into inhuman beasts, their genetic code completely rewritten in mere seconds, their bodies reshaped by the, by the terrible power of the warp, and, as for their souls, few dare wonder as to their fate. Certainly, the things that now inhabit Illyrium lack anything a psyker might recognize as sentient mind. Since then, Illyrium had been a land of havoc and mayhem, torn apart by endless fights between its monsters. Islands of floating rock clashed together, driven by the aggression of their inhabitants. Every monster of Illyrium is descended from human stock, and the horrors on display in that savage land are nearly on par with those of the Nineteen Legion's own demonic homeworld. From time to time, champions of chaos will venture into this dangerous region, seeking glory by slaying the greatest beasts. Few ever return, and those who do not make that mistake again. There is only one path between Illyrium and the mega city of Macrog. The Bridge of Cold Torment, guarded by the Illyrium Legion. The Bridge of Cold Torment is built from the soul stuff of everyone who took part in the infamous riots that killed Connor Gulliman, foster father of the Avenging Sun. Their shades were dragged from the warp's depths and bound into the haunting structure, from the corrupt senator who feared Connor's reforms to the soldiers who merely followed the orders of those whom their families had served for generations. The bridge itself is a structure of bone, muscle, and tendon. Mm, yeah, and faces, of course. Of course, faces. As the wind courses through their, own, their open mouths, the sound of screaming fills the air, and there is always wind on the bridge of cold torment, breezing and biting. Ice forms on the bridge out of the soul's paint tears, forming ostrich hands that are smashed to pieces by the armored boots of his defenders with the sound of shattering of shattered bone. No one is quite sure how the bridge came to be. There were no ultramarines on Macrog when the ruined storm erupted, and the construction was already there when they returned after the siege of Terra. There are those who advocated for its destruction, as it gave the monsters of Illyrium a way into more civilized into the more civilized lands of Macrog, but the myth it had created, that it was created by the Primarch to punish his old enemies, prevented that from coming to pass. None wanted to risk bringing the, dis the disfavor of the spiritual liege upon themselves by releasing his enemies from their suffering. Instead, the lords of the Ultramarines raised the Illyrium Legion to stand guard on the bridge. The Illyrium ne Region, <laughs> the Illyrium Legion, is a name given in mockery to the thousand evocati who are stationed at the bridge permanently, tasked with guarding it and preventing the dangers of Illyrium from mixing with the perils of Macrog Civitas. Attacks are infrequent but predictable, forcing the thin-blooded warriors into a state of perpetual readiness. The lifespan of these evocatis is short, and those who survive more than a few years are some of the most capable warriors of Macrog though it is rare for them to have a chance to use these skills to enhance their lifestyle. There are no true legionnaires at the bridge, for the sons of Gulman considered their, this duty beneath them. The ultramarines closest to the bridge are the apothecaries. Wait, 
the ultramarines closest to the bridge are the apothecaries, who maintain their genetic facilities where new avocati are bred, are bred to replace the losses of the Illyrium Legion. They are also tasked with ensuring that the condition of their creations holds, and have performed that duty well over the centuries. It is exceedingly rare for a member of the Illyrium Legion to rebel against the cruelty of his assigned fate, and, on the rare occasion it has happened, the would-be rebel has always been slain promptly by his brethren, who are all convinced that only through honorable death can their souls be elevated from their hybrid condition and be reborn as true sons of Gulliman. The one mercy of their condition is that all their mem all is that all memories of their previous lives are wiped out. None of them remember how they were offered up to the Ultramarines as babies, often by their own parents. The Tyranids flowed out of Illyrium in a compact mass and hit the bridge of cold torment like a hammer blow. The Illyrium Legion was ready, having already had to fight off the beast when the Xenos Horde had driven before it. Automated defense op defenses opened fire, while Evocati stood on high walls and fired at the mass of kittenous flesh with all manners of, the of their weapons. Wait, no, I lost the line. With all manners of the weapons, but the walls were covered in a thick layer of supernatural ice. <laughs> and the Tyranid's claws could pierce through it to form rudimentary holds to climb. Soon battle was joined on the battlements, while acid projectiles arched over the walls and rained down into the courtyard beyond. Thirteen successive walls barred the path of the Tyranid horde, each higher and better defended than the last. Among the hierarchy of the Illyrium Legion, to be assigned to the outermost wall was a death sentence, and the mark of honor all at once. This was, the n this was where the nearest, newest recruits, the unstable and the damaged, were sent to deal with the most frequently assaulted and absorb the casualties. But despite their flaws, the avocati of the bridge's outer walls were still scions of Gulliman's blood, however diluted and they fought bravely against the Tyranids. The few psychers stationed at the walls, humans and mutants all, trolls of the Illyrium Legion, of which no member would ever have been allowed to possess psychic abilities and live, screamed at the coming of the swarm. Their minds had already suffered much as Macrog was shaken to its core by the battle being fought in the south, and now the pressure of the rabid, insane fragments of the hive mind that had endured the ruin storm and the long sleep were too much to bear. They wept and laughed and clawed their own eyes out, while around them reality rip rippled as their power ten tried to reshape it into the shape of the nightmares of kitten and claws. Fortunately for the defenders, the Tyranids also lacked psychic forces, as the zone tropes that had come to Macrog hadn't survived the cold their enormous brains too susceptible to the freezing temperatures. The outer walls fell quickly as their defenders withdrew to the next ones. In, order to, in good order, despite the Tyranids snapping at their heels. The first three walls were abandoned, still slowing down the hordes as it was forced to climb up, to climb up and down each of them. And the Tyranids descending the third wall's inner side were easy targets for the Evocati manning the fort the last cannons, heavy bolter turrets, and other defenses opened fire on the Xenos, turning the space between the third and fourth wall into a killing zone that few Tyranids managed to cross. For a while, it seemed that the Illyrium Legion was going to win, to hold back the swarm through sheer firepower. Then came Old One Eye, immense and terrible, and followed by more of his gigantic breed. The fractured lands were home to some huge monstrosities but none compared to the sheer bulk of the ancient Carnifex. It crashed through the fallen walls, barely slowing its charge and leaving in its wake a path for the rest of the swarm to pour through. The fourth wall's defenses were trained on it immediately, but what damage they managed to inflict to its thick carapace vanished almost immediately by the creature's regeneration, unaffected by its long slumber. slumber. When the Evocati baited it in warp fire from a device the Dark Mechanicum has sent to the bridge to be tested. The Carnifex simply walked through the flame, its kitten blackened but otherwise unharmed, and tore the engines to shreds, sending the demons, the demon bound within back into the Sea of Souls. The fourth wall fell, 
and this time the retreat was neither orderly nor disciplined. Twelve Carnifex followed old One-Eye, roused from their hibernation by a call no spawn of the Great Devourer could ignore. The Evocati were as brave as children, reforged into instruments of war, and sent to die in a war no one important cared about could be, but even they recoiled from the sheer size of the Carnifex and the seemingly invulnerability of the beast leading them. One by one, the walls fell, with the smaller, faster Tyranids running through the rubble to join in the carnage. Hundreds of Evocati fell between one wall and the next, fighting till their last breath to break through the swarm. From time to time, Old One-Eye caught an Evocati in its enormous claws, biting off pieces of flesh with teeth the length of chainswords. chainsword. There was far too little nourishment to be had in such bites, but the psychological effect was great, and every aspect of the Carnifex shape and behavior had been carefully designed by the Great Devourer's cold alien intellect. True authorities may have hold their ground, but the Avocati, <laughs> for all their transhuman prowess, were still thin-blooded. Many still knew fear and indoctrination could only go so far to suppress the survival instincts without making them useless as warriors. But when the battle finally reached the thirteenth and final wall, standing taller than any other at the eighth tenth of the way on the bridge, the retreat stopped. No matter the strength of the enemy horde, the, Ill the Illyrium Legion could go no further, for the sorcerers of the Ultramarines had cast a powerful gas upon the bridge, and every member of the Illyrium Legion. And every member of the Illyrium Legion, yeah, powerful spell. The Evocati could not leave the bridge from the southern side, not without direct orders from an acknowledged superior on the 13th. They were trapped, caught between the strength of the spell and the Tyranid swarm. Still, they had the 13th wall to defend, and the last barrier between Illyrium and the rest of Macrog had been the one in which the Ultramarines had put the most resources over the years. They may not care how many Evocati died fighting the horrors of the fractured land, but they, didn't, but they didn't want these same horrors reaching their own territories either. The last wall was several hundred meters high, its exact height varying from day to day thanks to the warp-infused metal that had been used in its construction. It was very much alive, host to a vicious conscience that fed off the suffering of, of the bridge's souls and answered only reluctantly to the commands of the Illyrium Legion, fighting against the Gias binding it every time it was given orders. Evocat is stationed at the wall. Wait, Evocat is stationed at the wall had been known to disappear without trace, and it was rightly suspected that the wall, the wall itself, has swallowed them, devouring them body and soul when they wandered into dark corridors alone. For that reason, only the leader of the Illyrium Legion and his direct subordinates were stationed there permanently. Though only the former were somewhat safe from the demon's depredation, thanks to the authority invested in him by the Ultramarines. The current leader of the Illyrium Legion was named Ilian Nastasi. As a Romanian, this, isn't, this joke will never not be funny for me. Called the half-breed behind his back, along with a variety of less respectful nicknames. Iliam had been the result of a unique experiment, when an apothecary of the 13th Legion had attempted to add Eldar DNA to the, thin, to the thin gene seed used to create the Evocati. Of the 180 test subjects, only he had survived the ravages inflicted by the two conflicting gene codes. He had the bulk of an Astarte, but was unnaturally thin, his face endure, gaunt and with two long bones that showed his origins to anyone who had ever seen an Eldar. His creator had lost interest in him soon after he had passed a few tests of his endurance and martial ability, both by fighting in training pits and by avoiding the assassination attempts from other ultramarines, who saw his existence as, you guessed it, an abomination. These attempts had stopped after he had been sent to the bridge, though he had to kill several other Evocati to force the arrest to accept him. The only reason he was the leader of the Illyrium Legion was because something in his genos tainted blood allowed him to control the demon wall more easily than any other candidate, and because none of the other claimants wanted to fight him for it, at least not after he had gutted the first three to challenge him within seconds of the ritual duel. 
Standing atop the 13th wall, Ilion now called upon the advantage. He exerted his will and commanded the wall to unleash all of its powers or power upon the tyrannid horde host. Sure. The metal ripped as the Xenos started to climb, and the thin ice upon its surface shattered as claws reached out and human maws opened to swallow the alien's hole. Atop the wall, the remaining Evocati of the Illyrium Legion fought on, slaying the Xenos who managed to reach the battlements. A protective circle formed around their leader that he may continue to call upon the wall's power to aid them. When old One-Eye charged the wall, this time the structure held. Though it shook from its base to its top, Ilian winched as sympathetic pain flowed through his link to the wall, and once more when the Carnifex hammered the wall again and again and again, there was a strength in the beast that went beyond mere muscle and mass, a strength of purpose that burned the demon inside the wall and weakened its hold onto the metal caging it. The half-breed could sense the anger of the Neverborn, both at the impact and at the futile futility of its own attempts to damage the Tyranid. No matter what the demon unleashed, the Carnifex shrugged it off and continued to beat onto the wall, joined by the rest of its enormous kindred. These the wall could kill. It tore them apart with tendrils of pure blackness, rotted their, thin, their tiny brains with clouds of pestilence, and made their bones twist and break with words of power shouted from screaming mouths. And, as it did so, blood began to flow from Ilian's mouth and eyes as the exertion caught up to him. No Evocati had ever been meant to wield such sorcerous power, given by proxy. Yet still, old One-Eye stood. Still, it hammered at the wall, and still the Tyranid horde came, climbing onto the pile of their dead at the base of the wall. Cracks began to spread where old one eye struck, and the half-breed felt the demon's panic and focusing of all its efforts onto the Carnifex, giving the rest of the swarm free reign to climb and fight the Evocati. And as the wall suffered, so did the entire bridge, which shook with the powerful Neverborn's impotent fury. His mind burning with the demon's rage and pain, Ilion threw off the arms of his concerned comrades and rushed towards the edge of the battlements, his blade cutting any tyranny in his path through ribbons, and leapt from the edge of the wall, plunging hundreds of meters down and landing directly on the head of old One-Eye at the exact moment it struck the 13th wall for the last time. Ilian's power sword, driven by the strength of his fall, pierced through the Carnifex's thick skull and stabbed into its brain, frying it instantly. Inside his armor, nearly every bone in Ilian's body shattered at the impact, and as the commander of the Illyrium Legion died from the extreme trauma, the, play, the pain flowed through the link between him and the demon, combined with the damage inflicted by the Carnifex. This was too much and the demon screamed in agony as it lost its hold onto the half-reality of Macrog. Ancient word, words shattered and the thirteenth wall fell. And as the last barrier between Illyrium and the rest of Macrog fell, the final defense activated. A last recourse, a final solution to protect the rest of the Avenging Sun's world. Sorcery woven into the very bridge of cold torment thousands of years ago flared to life and in one single moment, the bridge exploded, exploded, taking with it every single one of the surviving Evocati and Tyranids. Such was the strength of the Elder's detonation that everyone on the planet sensed it, as did the opex of the ships in orbit, temporarily blinded by the overload. In his ritual chamber, deep within the fortress of Hera, Varro Tigurius sat with his eyes closed. The Sorcerer Lord and second-in-command to Marneus Kalgar has sensed the ancient pacts protecting the world shuttered as the renegades stored their way to the path of glory, to the path to glory. Disrespecting the thirteen sacred traditions, combined with the release of the Loted Ones and the destruction of Mortendar, Tigurius feared that the entire system may collapse, engulfed into the wild dissolution of chaos unbound. More than that, he wondered if this may be the Sacrifice Sun's true plan. There were many stories about the Lord of Kalt. No one knew for sure what exactly he had become after unleashing the Ruin Storm. 
he had survived the efforts of the Legion to destroy him. More than that, he had thrived, judging by the armada he had gathered. None could tell just how powerful Gage had personally become, that he could keep such a varied host under control. Tigurius feared that the entire Black Crusade, with all this destruction and mayhem, was only a ploy, a distraction to the traitor's true end. He had shared his concern with his lord, and Kalgar had ordered him to find the truth before the enemy reached the fortress and his sorcery was needed. Which was why he was here, and in the middle of, pro of a protective circle that had been consecrated with the names of hundreds of demons and the blood of a son of every Primarch, and by the gods had the second eleventh samples been hard to obtain. Of course. Nothing of the warp could get through without his permission, not even Dorn nor Sanguinius themselves, at least not for a while. With his body protected from outside interference, Tigurius' spirit soared high, contemplating the tides of the great ocean, searching for patterns and threats. Usually, the beauty of the sight would have given him pause. The balance of the four powers, the flow of worship and offerings, the will of the spiritual liege made manifest. Macrog was, was, a, was a perfect exemplar of what mankind could be under the rule of the Ultramarines, of course. But the day that beauty was marred, the delicate balance unraveling. For now nothing had been done that the Pacts could not repair. Things had been much worse after the Tyranid invasion. But with Belakor unleashed, Tigurius had honestly thought Kalgar would kill him on the spot for not sensing the Demon Prince's presence before... In all other things, the invaders were blindly disturbing. Things could turn much, much, much worse. He could sense the destruction wrought by the Black Crusade, sense that the prayers and devotions of the cultists host as it threw itself in the path of Cage's army. But something else had drawn his attention. Something to the north. Flying above the still untouched northern districts of Makrog Civitas, he arrived at the bridge of Cold Torment, and watch as the Tyranids once more fought and killed the sons of Guliman. At least this time, only, only Evocati were dying. But there was something wrong. Tigurius saw one Evocati die, torn to pieces by the great beast leading the Xenos horde. But he did not see his soul depart his torn flesh. In fact, he could not see this swarm of incorporeal Neverborn he would have expected to see on such a battlefield, feasting upon the emotions and souls of the dead and dying. Something was very wrong here, something that had nothing to do with the damage the war was inflicting upon the great spell keeping Macrog intact. Tigurius called upon his powers, treading the path of time backwards and forwards, looking at the slaughter of the bridge from all angles. He needed to look at the bigger picture, to see things from a god's own point of view. He flowed the threat of a thousand Evocati souls, and as they passed from life to death, then he saw the destruction of the bridge, filled the obliteration of the souls that made up the great construction. And in that moment, he discovered the truth of what was really happening on Macrog. The shock knocked him back into his body, behind his words still glowing with eldritch power, still impervious to intrusion. But he wasn't alone in his chambers anymore. On the other side of the circle, standing directly in front of him, was a being the likes of which he had only encountered one time before, but no psyker who had ever met the Tetra could forget their aura. I know why you are here, said Tigurius, kneeling. I am loyal, and I do not and do not fear my fate. I serve the Legion and the Primarch with my life, and shall do so with my death. Do what you came to do. And with his invitation, the Tetra passed right through the inviolate field, the defense is no longer able to stop him. He raised his clawed hand towards Tigurius' head. When news of the bridge's battle reached Kalgar, he was enraged. He had wanted to call the Illyrium Legion back to the fortress of, Ther of Hera, so that the Evocati may give their lives to defend their betters under the silent gaze of Guliman himself. But though the Tyranid advance had been stopped with the bridge's destruction, none of the Illyrium Legion had survived. To make matters worse, his greatest sorcerer, Varro Tigurius, was nowhere to be found, and even after the chapter master sent a squad into his second-in-command's private chambers. Fuming, Kalgar ordered all his forces to be even more cautious, 
worry of assassins in their midst. With Igorius missing, and probably dead, the sorcerers of the Fortress of Terra were leaderless. And now, it was not the time for them to go through the ritual challenges and intrigues that would allow one of them to raise to supremacy. The Black Crusade had continued its advance and would soon reach the outer perim perimeter of the fortress, and then the loyal Ultramarines would face the might of the host gathered by the sacrificed sun and the rage of the first demon prince. Unfortunately, the fortress was still protected from sorcerers' attacks thanks to the sorcerers of the Temple of Ptolemy, keepers of the stronghold's ancient wards. The Temple of Ptolemy While the Ultramarines are fanatical in their devotion to chaos, their sorcerers have an approach much more similar to that of other traitor legions. Immensely proud, they see themselves as masters of the warp powers rather than servants of the entities found therein. They see the dark gods for much closer than anyone else, and those not driven insane by that knowledge became much less devout, understanding that in the end the ruinous powers care little for ceremony so long as their fueling emotions rage on and deeds continue to be performed in their name. Such heresy is tolerated by the rest of the Legion because of, an an because of ancient provisions made for them by Gulliman himself during the days of the heresy. Though part of the reason why they are still respected is the sheer power wielded by the warp weavers. Nowhere is this difference in belief more obvious than in the Temple of Ptolemy, a vast structure occupying an entire spur of the Crown Mountains chain where the fortress of Hera is located. The temple is said to have been founded by the first and greatest of the ultramarine sorcerers, though that is likely to be a mere self-aggrandizing hyperbole, seeing as the Imperium has no records of any ultramarines of that name. Within the temple are countless stones of dark lore pertaining to the summoning and binding of demons, including the true names of thousands of Neverborn. The sorcerers who live in the temple fiercely fiercely defend their privacy, performing unholy experiments behind closed doors and powerful wards. On several occasions, these rituals have gone catastrophically wrong, but the temple's activities are still tolerated by the chapter master of Macrog. That is because the Circle of Ptolemies is also responsible for the maintenance of the powerful spells that keep several greater demons imprisoned within a complex nexus of energies their power fueling the arcane defenses of the fortress of Hera. How these demons came to be imprisoned has long since been lost, safe in the deepest archives of the temple, accessible only to its circle of masters. The temple is also responsible for the training of the 13 legion sorcerers. Recruits with psychic potential are brought by the warband sworn to the Lord of Macrog's banner, and less than one in ten emerges again and those who do are among the most dangerous war preavers among the traitor legions. The teachings of the temple's masters are harsh, and no sorcerer completes his training with his soul intact. It is said that the master keeps a, silver, a sliver of the soul of every student to ever pass through the temple, as insurance against treachery. Certainly, on the few occasions where a temple-trained sorcerer has attempted to share his secrets, their death has been quick and horribly painful, and it's unlikely their torments ended after their demise either. How the masters are chosen is unknown to any beyond their ranks. Many believe that all of them are legionnaires from the time of the heresy, and that they had stayed in this position all, the time, all this time, despite the danger of their craft and ambition of their apprentices. Regardless of the truth, their power is immense, and even the Lord of Macrog must respect their boundaries, and perhaps and phrase any request to the Temple of Ptolemy politely. In the long history of the Ultramarines, the chapter master who did not soon vanished, their names removed from the Legion's annals, except as a cautionary tale about the perils of drawing the Temple's wrath. Unbeknownst to Kalgar, however, Cage's coalition had already a plan in motion to deal with the temple. When Belakor had been released, the firstborn prince had activated one of his most useful pawns, none other than one of the masters of the temples themselves. The sorcerer's mind had been infected through one of his apprentices, who himself had been infected by one of the temple's acolytes, who in turn had been infected by one of Belakor's cultists, 
while on an errand for his lord outside the temple. It had taken centuries for the tiny psychic sending seeds to grow. It had taken centuries for the tiny psychic seed to grow. And in that time, Belacor had had to be extremely careful, refraining from even the smallest manipulation, lest he reveals his hand before the appointed time. And when the seed had bloomed at last, he had destroyed the sorcerer's free will, making him nothing more than a puppet following Belacor's single order. None bear the puppet's path, for he was a master of the temple, and only his peers may question him. He went deep below the temple, into the vast caverns where the greater demons were bound. Their power slowly bled and replaced by careful monetary sacrifices. And there, with the baleful will of the firstborn prince burning in his soul, he spoke the words of unbinding, destroying the words that had stood for thousands of years. The other master sensed the intrusion at once, but the disturbance of the Aether caused by the ongoing war and the destruction of the Bridge of Cold Torments prevented them from teleporting directly into the caverns. By the time they arrived on foot, it was too late. One by one, the greater demons were freed, each vanishing in a flash of eldritch light, leaving behind nothing but scorched stone and echoing promises of retribution. Only one greater demon remained when the Twelve Masters rushed in, a lord of change cackling as it loomed over the unwilling betrayer who had freed it. Before the master's eyes, it picked up the sorcerer lord and bit his head clean off with his tooted beak, swallowing what little was left of his soul. It stared at the masters, its inhuman glare piercing through their golden mask, and spoke two single words before vanishing back into the realm of its kind. He comes. With the release of the greater demons, the sorcerer's defenses of the fortress of Hera fell for the first time since Cage had last come to Macrog to bring fire and death to its own to his own legion. The last obstacle between the Black Crusade and the fortress was gone, and a great cry rose from the burning city as the scattered hosts gathered more once more to march on to the final battle. Marius led the way, surrounded by swarming loaded ones, and cut troops broke and cult troops broke and fled before him. They had seen too much of their world destroyed, and the sight of the sacrifice son and his escort of Lords of Chaos was too much for them to stand against. And so, the Black Crusade entered what had once been the Valley of Laponis, changed beyond recognition by the warp and dark industry. On the walls of the fortress of Hera, Marneus Kalgar had passed beyond fury and into a cold, quiet rage that made his subordinates even more uneasy. The coals had been broken, the sorcerer's defenses cast down, but he was far from done. There were 1,000 ultramarines holding the fortress, and though the Legion of Illyrium was lost, and with it, the most veterans of the Evocati, he had still been able to marshal a veritable host of the thin-blooded spawns of the apothecaries. They had not been allowed within the fortress, lest they desecrated with their presence, but they had been massed before its walls, their minds filled with the promises of glory that awaited them if they fought well under their Primarch's gaze. The most dangerous force of the Black Crusade was the ghostly traitor Cage had freed from the, right, the rightful imprisonment on Mortendar. The loaded ones were beyond physical harm, and there weren't enough sorcerers and demonic weapons among the defenders to fight them off efficiently. Marneus didn't know how to fight them, but there were other powers at work on this battlefield, and as the Black Crusade approached, they made their move. In the depths below the fortress of Hera, a gate had remained sealed for 10,000 years opened. A host of the dead passed through, walking by the desiccated corpses of an ancient caretaker, at last released from his millennia of faithful obedience to an oath he had never understood the true implications of. Animated statue of black-veiled white marble, gissen born of the echoes of every ultramarine who had ever died in battle with Gulliman's name on his lips. For an entire age they had remained hidden from sight, their numbers slowly growing, but now they had been released, set free by the unseen hand of the Tetrak. They were the glorious ones, from an ancient Terran legend related to the antique goddess after which the fortress was named. Nothing remained of who they had been in life, save for their appearance, 
The soul of the dead was long since gone, departed to whatever afterlife their deeds had earned them. These were mere after-images, imprint left onto the warp and given new bodies of animated stone, driven by a singular will none could resist, for they had no will of their own. The glorious ones emerged from hidden entrances in their thousands, and the Avocati parted to let them pass, filled with a deep sense of awe at the sight of the Legion's honored dead, returned to fight in one last battle. A, cause descend a pause descended upon the battlefield as armies that had been about to butcher each other watched, incredulous, as the Legion's past returned to haunt it. The, force, the forces of the Black Crusade steered in easily as these unexpected reinforcements approached, but the loaded ones reacted much more violently. They recognized some of the warriors marching towards them, and their hatred flared at the sight of the other honored dead of the Legion they had sought to destroy. Enraged beyond any hope of control, they surged ahead of Gage's army, and the living of both sides watched as the dead of the Thirteen Legion waged war against each other. The loaded ones were outnumbered by the animated Jysons, more than a hundred to one, and their psychic manipulation was useless against these undead golems. But they had powers, and marble flew as the walking memories were shat shattered by the storms of eldritch lightning. However, the echoes that animated the glorious ones also gave them purchase on their enemies' ethereal forms, and one by one the loaded ones were pulled down and destroyed by sheer weight of numbers. The raids could have departed at any time, flown far from the reach of the glorious ones, but their hatred and desire to destroy them were too strong. For several hours, neither Gage's host nor the fortress's defenders dared to make a move, as the space between them was stormed by a battle none of them had any place in. The grudges of the dead belonged to the dead, and the living had no place in them. Eventually, the battle relented. Both sides had obliterated each other with the last few glorious ones turned to dust with a single command from, Gage's, from Gage to his sharpshooters. What had become of the Lotus ones defeated by the animated statue was unknown. Certainly, none of the psychers in either armies could sense their hateful aura anymore. In any case, they had been removed from the equation, and now it was time for brute force of arms in legion-to-legion -legion warfare. Marius Gage raised his clawed hand to the blood-tinted sky, and with a great roar, the army sworn to his banner charged forth, crushing the shards of marble underfoot. And the Evocati Calgar had gathered to bleed for his cause, roared too, and charged as well. Both sides were made mostly of the ultramarine's thin blood, but no one cared. The gods were watching, and all that mattered was war. But when the two hordes made contact, and transhuman blood flowed, Marius Cage and his Lords of Chaos were nowhere to be seen. They landed far beyond the walls, far beyond the lines of battle whose sound followed them as they flew. Blackwar had carried them on wings of shadows, hiding them from all detection of with, his, with his power. And yet, when clawed foot and ceramide boots hit the ground before the stairs leading to the Temple of Correction, Kalgar was still there, waiting for them with a hundred terminators. For a long moment, they stared at each other, hatred coursing through every single one of them. Then the Lord of Macrog and the Sacrificed Son stepped forward, leaving their warriors behind until they were less than two meters away from each other. Slave, growled Marius Cage. Traitor, spot back Marneus Kalgar. They stared at each other for a few seconds, before Marius spoke once more. You can still stop all this, you know. Just step aside, or let me in. No more of our brothers need to die today. But he must be destroyed before he drags us all into oblivion. He is our master. He is our lord. Everything you have done your entire miserable life is a betrayal of what it means to be an ultramarine. What do you know about being an ultramarine? The sudden shout was so powerful it forced Kalgar back a step and set cracks running through the ground. The Terminator focused their weapons from the warlords to Cage, but didn't open fire. The fire around Gage's skull flared, the equivalent of taking a deep breath for the Chaos Lord. I was there, he said more calmly. 
at the very beginning, when we really were ultramarines, before he broke everything we were on the altar of his dark ambition and remade us from warriors into mere tools to his ends. You are no ultramarine, Kalgar. You are what he made the Legion into. You are a slave. I am a loyal son, said Kalgar. You have never seen your father, never talked to him. You don't know who, what he was at the end. Listen to me. Right now, thousands are dying outside these walls. And you know what? He isn't worth it. He does not deserve your loyalty, your devotion. Look at those who stand with me. Even the dark gods themselves have turned their back on him and sent their champions to end his legacy once and for all. Cage spread out his arms, gesturing to the splendor all around them. If he is truly blessed by them, then how am I here? If he is all watching and powerful, then how is it that I stand here at the heart of his power? He started shouting again. Where is your liege now, Marneus Kalgar? He is with me always, for I am faithful, replied the Lord of Macrog before charging the sacrificed sun, with the gauntlets of Ultramor cracking with sorcerous energies. And that was it. The Lord of Chaos and the Terminator fought, while in the center of it all, two of Gulliman's greatest sons tried to kill each other. So complete was their focus, so absolute their determination to end their opponent's life, neither of them noticed the larger battle. Cage's infernal claws slashed with the gauntlets clashed, Excuse me, not slashed. It would have been cool if it slashed, but no. And just clashed with the gauntlets, power fields again and again. Each collision sending sh shock waves of such strength that the nearest terminators were sent flying like leaves in the wind. Body parts rained as Belakor picked up warriors and tore them apart with gleeful abandon, revealing in the slaughter after so long restrained. Titus's demon bound chainsword cut through reinforced warplate with ease while Castus' mace broke through it like wet paper, its aura of dissolution too, m dissolution too much even for the warded armor of Macrog's Terminator elite. Sicarius danced around the blows, moving with unhuman speed, his blade aiming for the weak spots in the warped armor. With the power infusing him, the working only need needed only to nick the flesh of his foes to doom them to a, sh to a slow, agonizing death as the energies he had claimed from the greater demon poised them, poisoned them. And Uriel's alien blade simply ignored the physical presence of his foes, cutting through them with the same ease as through empty air, allowing Uriel to focus all his attention on avoiding being hit. The Chaos Lord took wounds, but they were soon surrounded by a growing pile of corpses, while the duel inside the circle both sides the circle both sides had quickly formed around their leaders continued. Eventually the last of the Terminators fell, and the Chaos Lord's cry circled around the duel, keeping their distance, watching as two legends of the Ruin Storm fought to the death. Kalgar hadn't truly fought since the Tyranid invasion, and it had been many centuries since Gage had, for had been forced to use the full extent of his skills and powers, yet neither of them had lost any of their edge. After several minutes, the battle ended when Cage, tired of the duel, unleashed his unhuman abilities. A wave of black fire burst forth from his skull, engulfing Kalgar's head and passing right through his personal force field, as if it, if it weren't there. Kalgar staggered as his face burned off his skull, and in that moment, Cage rammed both his clawed hands into the Lord of Macrog's chest, lifting him up with the strength of the impact. The sacrificed son held his skewered foe up, and Kalgar glared down with eyes that were the only thing left of his once proud patrician features. He tried to speak, to cast one final curse at his victor, but all that came out of his charred lips was a mouthful of blood, and the light finally faded from his eyes. Without ceremony, Cage threw the corpse to the ground and went on to fulfill his destiny. At the precise moment that the Lord of Macrog fell and the Lords of Chaos entered the Temple of Correction, the battle outside the fortress's walls shifted. Both sides of the war had brought dem demonium venerators into the fray, 
These ancient possessed marines who had been the first to receive the dubious gift of sharing their flesh with one of the Neverborn. They had fought both for the Black Crusade and against it, though they had never come to blows. But now, all of a sudden, all of them started killing indiscriminately, turning on their former allies without pause or mercy. The battle descended into utter chaos as the lines between friend and foe dissolved and the power of the Venatores battered at the psyches of the Evocati, driving them insane with bloodlust. And during all of that, every time a sign of Guliman's blood fell, his soul vanished from sight, caught and drawn into a ritual 10,000 years in the making. Far above the blood-soaked battlefield, the Dark Gods watched and held their breath as destiny long denied was once more set into motion. It was only when Conrad died on Ishvan Tree that most Primarchs realized that they were indeed mortal after all. When the blood of the King of Knights spilled onto the black sands and he did not rise again. Well, traitors and loyalists alike witnessed the death of what some part of them had thought divine, no matter what the Imperial troop proclaimed. The Imperial dream died at Ishvan. But it wasn't the only myth that perished in the opening salvos of the Robutian heresy. Every Primarch who still stalks the stars knows that he was born mortal. Even those who have, who have since transcended their origins to join the ranks of the Neverborn Princes. But bearing extreme circumstances such as Horus's destruction under the fangs of Sanguinius. It takes a long time for a Primarch to die even from wounds as grievous as the ones inflicted upon Guliman by his father in the final hour of the Siege of Terra. And so, when the morning ultramarines placed their father into stasis, not even they knew what that some spark of life lingered within his broken form. The tiniest spark, really. Had not they real delayed but a single hour, the soul of Guliman would have lost his last connection to the Materium, and gone on to the other side of the Veil, to suffer his reward from the dark gods he had failed. In the ruined storm, suspended between life and death, caught out of time by the stasis field, Robut Guliman endured agonies none could possibly imagine. He was torn from time and space, life and death, and was made to see the universe as the gods see it. He went mad, then sane, then mad again, over and over, until nothing remained of who he had been, until Robut Guliman, son of Connor Guliman, was gone, and only the dark master of chaos remained. We're getting some Archon type of deal here, aren't we? And in that eternity of torment, he cast his mind through the path of blood, manipulating his sons even as he saw through their eyes and spoke his will through their souls. He bent his terrible intellect to one purpose that mattered to him. Freedom from the hellish suffering. No matter the cost, no matter who had to die, the Dark Master would do it without hesitation to be released, even if it meant committing the most unforgivable, unforgivable of sins, upon one upon which mankind has looked with horror since its earliest days, the murder of one's children. He had woven wrath and hatred into their hearts and made them wage war upon one another. He had roused the fires of fury and ambition, whispered of vengeance and glory. And so they had come to fight and spill the legion's blood. And with every death, every soul that bore his mark slipping into the aether, he grew a bit stronger, a bit further from death and closer to life. It wouldn't have worked before, but now the veil was thinner. Those who thought they were on the side of order had made it so, in their desperation to rekindle the spark of a hope long since dead. He fed on the souls of the dead ultramarines and Evocati, consuming everything they had been in order to fuel the ritual. Uh, to fuel the ritual his pawns had crafted all over Macrog across the ages. He devoured their lives and their deaths, denying even the dark gods their prize as he claimed it as his own due. And then, finally, as Cage and his cohorts crossed the fortress, while the first secondborn led the slaughter outside, it was done. The stasis field failed, and the body of Robut Gulman rose from the slumber of ages. His face was drawn and corpse-like, his hair pale, and his eyes there burned fo the fire that would consume the galaxy. 
an unbearably bright light that promised nothing but suffering to all who defied him. As Gulliman stood before his shocked sons, the ceiling of the sanctum exploded, showering all, showering all in the shards of marble and priceless glass, glass, and a terrible scream burned through their minds. The last Oisirian had come, sensing the awakening of the one who had exterminated its race. The strength of the alien's hatred was, too po was so powerful, it, tem it temporarily stopped the fighting going on outside the fortress's gates. As mortals fell to their knees in pain, and the demonium verotes, veneratores, paused, wearily looking in the direction of this new threat. The champion of Zinch screamed as it descended, speaking curses in its own tongue, which had no word for mercy. There was its moment, the one point where destiny could yet be rewritten, where chaos could turn its favor from the Dark Master before he could reclaim his full power. And so it plunged through Macrog's atmosphere like a burning comet aimed directly at the arch traitor. Four limbs nimbled in eldritch fire reached out for Gulliman's bare head and froze. Chains of sorcerous light suddenly appeared in the air, wrapped around the ancient Xenos and anchored to the sanctum's walls, holding the last Oisirian in place. It screamed again in rage and outrage, and Gulliman smiled as his trap unfolded. Slowly, with an almost obscene gentleness, he reached up with his right gauntlet, stroking the alien's face as one might a faithful pet. Then, with a single motion, he stabbed his claws into the alien's skull, perforating its enlarged brain with energy-clad metal and ending its life before swallowing its soul as it desperately fled. The sorceress chains created by a spell laid down centuries before, faded as the corpse hit the ground, and Gulliman turned his gaze towards his sons, who had remained immobile at the sanctum's entrance. Kneel before me, my sons, said Robut Gulliman, Primarch of the Ultramarines, Arch-Traitor of the Imperium, and reborn Dark Master of Chaos. The monstrous will of the Primarch washed over the gathered Chaos Lords like a tidal wave, battering at their minds. He called upon the loyalty re written into their blood, the conditioning all of them had undergone during their transformation into space marines. Even Belakor felt the urge to bend the knee, his infernal nature betraying him before the one who had claimed the favor of the gods, tearing the mantle of Dark Master from Belakor's millennia ago. The firstborn screamed in impotent rage as the will of the gods he sought to replace cursed, crushed on him and finally forced him on his knees for the first time in uncounted ages. Castus was the first Chaos Lord to kneel, with an anguished cry as the strength he drew from the demon Paramedes failed him for the first time. Then Titus fell down, his face contorted in pure grimace of hatred. Uriel stood for several more seconds, his body trembling with the effort of opposing Gulliman's inhuman strength, before he too bowed before the pressure. Sicarius was the last to kneel, his monstrous pride proving a great bulwark against Gulliman's domination, that all that anger, hatred, and determination of his cohorts. But not great enough in the end. Only Marius remained standing, staring at his father with burning eye sockets. Kneel, repeated Gulliman. Never, replied the sacrificed son. I will never kneel to you again. There was a pause, as the Dark Master watched his one defiant son, truly seeing him for the first time since he had risen from his throne. Something cold and inhuman passed on his cadaverous face, and when he spoke again, his words were dripped with venom. You, said Gulliman, are not Marius. Far away in the realm of, click of chaos, the clashing of blades and the spilling of blood stopped on the, pain, on the plains of slaughter. The court of change fell silent. The children of Nurgle stopped their game in their father's garden. The great debaucheries in the silver palace of Slanesh paused. No, I am not. On the ground, the Chaos Lords forced their heads to turn to stare at the sacrificed son in abject incomprehension. But he didn't look at them. 
His intention was wholly focused on Gulliman. Marius Gage is dead, continued the fiery-headed fiend. He died 10,000 years ago, and his soul was devoured by the demon Prince Samus. Nothing remains of him save, save echoes of pain and madness in the warp. But his name was a useful mass for me to hide behind. The sacrificed sun changed. His horns and flaming skull vanished, replaced by an old Mark IV red helmet. His wings folded in on themselves and faded from existence. The ruinous emblems upon his armor seemed to fall off like a serpent's shed skin, while its colors returned to those of the Thirteen Legion had wo worn during the glorious days of the Great Crusade, save for the shoulder pads where the Thirteen's emblem should have been displayed, which were painted over black. His claws diminished back into gauntlet hands that had held power sword and a pistol. I am your shame and sins, writ large upon the universe, skin and fire and fury, proclaimed the revealed warrior. I am all those you betrayed, every son you sent to die in the name of your ambition. I am the sacrificed son, the lord and last of the red marked, and you know my name. <laughs>